Listen, the debate about marijuana is a subject we focused on a lot on this program, from soaring arrest numbers in the city to connection to stop and frisk to medical marijuana a lot more. But tonight, we're going to really break it down to brass tacks and get into a debate here that we've heard a lot in recent years, whether or not to legalize marijuana. Toll-free number, bottom of your screen. I want you to call it right now and tell me what you think, whether or not now is the time, and there's a lot of components into this, Andrew, uh, whether or not it's long overdue, but also the economic component. You had an interesting conversation today about it. And that's where we're going to focus it, but we're bringing it up for a reason, Rich. It, as acceptance of marijuana use grows on a number of levels, we're seeing new pushes when it comes to marijuana laws. This November, ballot measures in three states will let voters decide whether to make marijuana completely legal. There are similar questions on the ballot in Detroit and in Springfield, Missouri, and legalization of marijuana, a key plank of Gary Johnson's libertarian candidacy for president. Of course, there would be significant legal and jurisdictional questions since marijuana would still be illegal on the federal level, but I digress. In addition, two to three states may consider legalizing medical marijuana this fall while Montana is seeking to repeal its medical marijuana law. An often overlooked part of the debate is the financial impact legalization would bring, along with the financial strains that current marijuana prohibition brings. For more on both subjects, I spoke this afternoon with Doug Fine. He is the author of the new book, Too High to Fail. Let's talk about the economic argument of legalizing marijuana. What would it, could it mean bottom line for, for governments across the country if we legalized and allowed the sale of marijuana? Up to $30 billion a year, Andrew, right off the bat. It already is America's number one cash crop. Uh, the problem is that none of it is taxed and none of it is part of the above ground economy. That all goes to the cartels. You mentioned prohibition. Uh, uh, enforcing prohibition, of course, comes with a cost, the war on drugs. How much could we save just by eliminating marijuana from our focus in the war on drugs? Well, for the last 40 years, over the last 40 years, we've spent one trillion of our taxpayer dollars to almost no effect. So uh, there's that money right there. We're putting something like nine billion dollars a year just in domestic enforcement. Enforcement in quotes there because it doesn't it doesn't do anything. So um, if we transfer that much needed money to other sectors sectors of our society, just keeping some in line for things like education and making sure that there isn't a use increase. Um, it's going to have, have a huge uh, sort of public sector uh, benefit in bottom line as well. You know, Doug, I can hear people already yelling at the TV said, well, this is just going to make for a nation of stoners or is certainly going to uh, make us less safe. What kinds of things can we put in place to make sure that people don't drive under the influence of marijuana? Is there sufficient testing, how we make sure it doesn't get into the hands of kids, those kinds of application of a legalization law uh, uh, focus? Andrew, that's a good question, and I just want to say before, before I answer it that maybe some people are yelling, but I've been surprised in my year of researching this topic and living on the front lines of the drug war to find how uh, widespread and increasing the support is for ending the drug war among all demographics. I'm talking about seniors. You've got Pat Robertson on the religious side. You've got George Schultz, Ronald Reagan's Secretary of State. Um, people are just aware of the fact that it doesn't work. Unlike alcohol, where it's fairly simple, blood alcohol content, um, THC, the psychoactive element in cannabis, stays in your system uh, longer. And so you're not under the influence of it when you'd still test for it. So I'm quite convinced that science uh, could come up with a way of uh, testing people, uh, not so much based on exact amount of THC, but rather you know, uh, your competence to be, let's say, operating a vehicle at a particular moment. Finally, Doug, you mentioned certain differences in generational uh, approaches to it. Uh, the older you get, the, the less experience people have with it and the more they oppose it. The younger uh, people you ask have more experience with it and seem to favor it. Uh, is this a question of if not when this becomes legal and what do you think is stopping politicians from taking a stand and supporting legalization? I do definitely think it's a question of if um, it, you know, it, it's a question of when, not if. Um, but um, amazingly, I'm not finding a whole lot of uh, older folks that are opposed to ending the drug war anymore. Um, to some degree, it's generational. But at this point, you've got people who first, uh, you know, had positive experience with cannabis, let's say, in the 60s. And now they're becoming senior citizens and they don't like the effects of some of the prescription drugs that they take. And they're finding cannabis, let's say, might be helping with their arthritis with far fewer side effects. Um, so um, it's, it seems to me like America's ready for it. As for what's keeping the politicians um, 
from hearing what uh, Gary Johnson calls the greatest disconnect between Americans and their and their uh, elected officials um, is uh, inertia. We've got a multi-billion dollar um, bureaucracy, private prison industry. We've just got a lot of forces in place that would like to keep another 40 years and another trillion dollars of our tax dollars flowing towards this you know, ridiculous, very un-American war. And so um, what it will take is people deciding that on the economic end, it's imperative to get this revenue flow from America's number one cash crop back into the legitimate economy and it's not some sort of, you know, immature college uh, stoner issue or something. It's it's really something that uh, is for the good of America. Doug Fine, author, author of Too High to Fail. Doug, thanks for a few minutes of your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. And it may surprise you, but the numbers appear to back up Fine's arguments. In a poll taken in May by conservative pollster Rasmussen, 56% of Americans said they supported marijuana legalization. It's the highest level of support in a poll we've ever seen. What's more, majority say they support legalization in the three states where it's on the ballot this fall, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington. Now, Rich, we've seen similar high polling numbers before other states had their referendum uh, on marijuana, and it almost always has gone down in failure, so we'll see if those numbers change. Now, we've debated this, you and me, many times. You're in favor of it. I am. Okay. And I am not. We'll bring the other table in this and bring you at home as well. What do you think? Would you like to see your state legalize marijuana? 888-766-2428. We're going to head to the phone lines to get table reaction on this after this. I don't like it personally, but it's time for a conversation about legalizing marijuana. It's a multi-million dollar industry in Washington state and we get no benefit. What if we regulate it? Have background checks for retailers, stiff penalties for selling to minors. We could tax it to fund schools and health care, free up police to go after violent crime instead. And we would control the money, not the gangs. Let's talk about a new approach, legalizing and regulating marijuana. All right. Hey, Center, make some money here for New York. Legalize weed and watch the revenues just come into the state coffers. What do you say? Yeah, I think that, that did a lot of good for, for California, right? Uh, they're well, they're out of all the... Oh, but yeah, yeah. So, But they don't have any problems at all with the policy that, that, that they... And that, by the way, in the state of yeah. uh, Washington, um, it, obviously uh, one of those ads... I'm sorry, what problems is California having with medical marijuana? If you look at the... There's a large, growing black market economy. They find it very hard to, to regulate. And what's very interesting, I, I like to follow the, the logic line on, on certain conversations. The very same people who want to make it illegal to, to drink a, a large supersized uh, soft drink or smoke anywhere on this planet are the same people in many instances who now want to make it legal uh, to smoke pot. And well, you know what? As a, as a guy who's think, never done drugs, Mayor never Bloomberg smoked... Is, uh, is, is really advocating legalization of marijuana. And the black market marijuana that you're talking about from the dispensaries in California is going to places where it's not currently legal. Here's my so question for you, Andrew. If I'm if I'm drunk and I get behind the wheel mm -hmm. um, and I get pulled over, they can tell right away if I blow something more than a .08 into it. If I show up at work here or whatever, and uh, where is the threshold that I can... So tell me one second. How do I know if somebody's stoned or not? I listened to your interview, and the guy said, well, you know, it, it basically stays in the bloodstream forever, so uh, you can't really... Um, you know, bang somebody if they did it because it could have been residue that was there for a week or two earlier. How do you qualify who's stoned and who's not? To my mind, it's how it's their performance. It's their performance in driving, and you can see if they're if they're driving in a. You don't use that standard for alcohol. No, I know you don't, but I would also argue that the standard that we currently use for alcohol is an, is not exactly a precise one either. There are plenty of people who attest to point oh eight who can drive fine with no impairments whatsoever. Well, point oh eight is still point oh eight. I understand, but there's a that's an arbitrary threshold that's oh, been set come down. On. You gotta and, and have a line, and I would Andrew. Think that, I would think that with greater testing, you'd be able to come up with something. Or how about I Dominic, see with my yeah, eyes that you're smart. not driving well. Well, it's a smirk because this is something that's, that's uh, very, very serious to me. My grandfather, who I have a lot of respect for, was a heroin addict in the city of New York. And I mean all the bad things, stealing from his family, out on the street. That's my grandfather, and I never had a father. So that's really my father figure. So this is not just some joke to me about, oh, let's go get high and smoke marijuana. This is real. I just want to say this one thing. I've been to hospitals a many night when kids thinking they're smoking regular marijuana and it blew their brains. Yeah. Never to be the same again.
So if you say it's time to have a, a discussion about legalized marijuana, I say yes. If you say it's time to fix the inequities in the legal system as it impacts uh, mostly young kids of color, then I say, from a law enforcement point of view, then I say yes. But if you say, let's, let's just make this okay, I remember when my grandmother, who had to deal with my grandfather as a heroin junkie, she would say to me, she didn't have much of a formal education, Richard, but she would say to me, boy, don't ever start, and I always remember this, don't ever start smoking marijuana, referring to it as a gateway drug. She would say, once you start smoking marijuana, next is cocaine, next is heroin, and so on and so on. Don't, we're we're going to, and Andrew, I'm going to let you jump in on that. Um, we got to go to break. When we come back, I'm going to let Andrew respond and also I'll bring you at home in. Phone lines jammed. We're going to get your reaction to the debate about whether or not your state ought to legalize marijuana. It's an imbalance, as Andrew said, in many a state right now. Would you want yours here to also put it to a vote as well? We'll be right back. All right, let's, um, Andrew, you want to respond real quickly? Dan? I did, and, and Dominic, I, 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 first of all, I thank you for sharing that story, and, and I appreciate it. Um, I'm not talking about heroin uh, as the story that you're related to, and I'm, I'm curious, have, have you ever had a drink? Have you ever had of alcohol? Course, of okay, course. but that's just as much a gateway drug as marijuana is. No, I'm it, sorry, it's Andrew, it's that, that's it's ridiculous. It's it certainly that, is. That's and, a, it Andrew, certainly, in and the housing projects where I come from, when kids smoke marijuana and blow their brains and blow their minds psychologically, and they're never the same, that's not the same as having a drink. It, well, first of all, you were talking about it as a gateway, and I'm right. saying that as a gateway, you could certainly make the same argument about uh, about alcohol or about legal prescription medications. The The second point is, for these kids who are smoking marijuana and blowing their minds up, I, I assume you're talking about kids who had laced marijuana, had PCP yes. involved in yes. it. That's, which is a legitimate problem when you have an unregulated Wild West kind of market. They're smoking the equivalent of bathtub gin. If they're going to a liquor store and they're buying a bottle of Jack Daniels, you know what you're getting. But when you buy homemade bathtub gin, there could be anything in there. And, that's, and so I would argue... That, that All right, let me, let me try and bring in real quick. Let me risk. bring in a couple calls. Barbara in Pennsylvania on the line. Thanks for holding, Barbara. What do you think? I agree that it should be legalized. And I agree with the gentleman that was just speaking that when you buy it on the street, you don't know what you're getting in it. And when you get something that's not right, there's so much gun violence or fights. And people get it from the black market. Okay. Okay, let me let me see if Michael agrees with you. He's calling us from Philly. Michael, you're on the line. Yeah, how you doing, Richard? Uh, Richard, I don't think it should be legal life because you have the same problems you have when people drink and drive. They'll be smoking weed and driving, and then you'll need a breath lunch for that. You know, so, no, I don't. Hey, hey, Rich, one more thing real quick, and I'm out of here. Listen, you know how you, you, know you have to take a background check for... Uh, buying guns or whatever. You know, Sir Richard, they want to create some new legislator. Everybody who wants to buy a gun, Richard, they should have to take uh, some kind of psychological evaluation. Right, we, uh, uh, we're, Michael, I like how you squeeze two topics into one here. Nice try. <laughs> I was sticking to the guns here. And I'm already at my time limit for this one. I could keep going. Trust me when I say phone lines are jammed. They've been lit up like a Christmas tree. And so this is what I want you to do. Go to our message boards here. Go to our Facebook page. Make your opinion heard. We'll do a mailbag on this tomorrow night. We'll be right back, everybody. Stay with us.